Uh, today, she may still be playing soccer, but her uh, main responsibility is serving as the director of the National Counterterrorism Center, which is a part of the office of the director of national intelligence. <coughs> this position requires Senate confirmation, uh, and she was confirmed as director by a voice vote on June 24th, 2021, just about two weeks after the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence held hearings on her nomination, which must be some kind of a record in modern day Washington, DC. The NCTC, as it also is called, was created in 2004 as a part of the restructuring of the nation's intelligence enterprise after the attacks of 9-11. Uh, she is the eighth person to hold that position, uh, the only woman and the only openly gay person to hold the position. Uh, Director Abizade has held an impressive array of other intelligence positions among them, she has served uh, on the National Security Council staff, both as director for counterterrorism and as senior policy advisor to the assistant president for homeland security and counterterrorism. She also has served on the, or with the Defense Intelligence Agency's Joint Intelligence Task Force Combating Terrorism and as the senior intelligence analyst in the Afghanistan-Pakistan division uh, and the Iraq-Middle East division. Uh, it was 9-11 that prompted Director Abizade to enter public service and in particular to pursue opportunities in counterterrorism. In describing the NCTC, she has said, it exists as the government's knowledge base on terrorism. She also has said of her career that she stumbled her way into being in the best job in government. Uh, I doubt that any of us would accept that description of her very impressive career path. And however she did it, flying, driving, or stumbling, uh, we're very grateful that she found her way to Pittsburgh this morning. Uh, so please join me in welcoming National Counterterrorism Center Director Christine Abizade. morning. Um, Mark, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And, um, and Laura, thank you for inviting me to speak here today, uh, even at the 8 o'clock hour. So thank you all for the brave souls that, that decided to come out and, um, and hear what we have to say today. You know, uh, it's really important to me that we at NCTC were able to represent at your conference. You've just uh, established a rep reputation even in just two years running of this being such an important and cross-cutting kind of way to bring expertise together and that we are a part of it, I think is really important to us at the center. So Laura, again, thank you very much for your leadership um, and for inviting me to speak here today. Um, so it is the eight o'clock hour and I will apologize at the outset. I, I have prepared remarks, so hopefully uh, we can keep them interesting for you. Uh, but I, I have them prepared because I wanna spend a little bit of time talking to you about aspects of the terrorism landscape today that I think are really important to emphasize. So bear with me. At the National Counterterrorism Center, we have been fighting against one form of hate-fueled violence since 2004. We have been fighting against terrorism. NCTC was born from 9-11, and the lessons from that tragic event remain foundational to our mission today. We protect Americans from terrorist groups and violent extremists. 
not least, as Mark mentioned, by serving as the U.S. government's central knowledge repository on international terrorism, and by unifying and integrating strategic intelligence across the foreign and domestic landscape. Now at NCTC, we've spent nearly two decades analyzing the global threat to understand the actors involved, their motivation, the impact of their actions. And with that knowledge and insight, our job is to enable others to take action to protect our communities. The counterterrorism mission today looks similar in some ways to the day that we were founded. At NCTC, we remain laser focused on Al Qaeda and the Islamic State or ISIS. But new dimensions have emerged since the early 2000s that create a complex and dynamic threat environment that cannot simply focus on Sunni Islamic violent extremists. In fact, today in the United States homeland, we are more likely to experience a terrorist attack by a lone actor than a highly structured group. And today's lone actors mobilize in unpredictable ways based on a range of motivations, whether inspired by a foreign terrorist organization or from ideologies unconnected to a single group. Among the most concerning of these lone actor threats, and the one I want to spend time on with you today, are those stemming from racially or ethnically motivated violence targeting innocent civilians. Racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, or REMVs for short, pose a sustained threat of violence to the American public. Again, that's why I felt it was so important to be here today, to engage the broad array of expertise that this summit has assembled. Those of you in this room represent the kind of cross-cutting community that are gonna, that's going to be necessary to tackle the extraordinary challenge of mitigating this type of hate-fueled violence. So today I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the REMV threat that we at the National Counterterrorism Center view as a transnational one. I'll talk about how that threat manifests domestically, and I'll end with providing you a sense of the kind of work NCTC does in this space, in particular the work that we do in cooperation with the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI, who are the lead for the United States government on issues of domestic terrorism. So with that roadmap, let me turn to the international dimensions of the REMV threat. At NCTC, we view the REMV problem that is plaguing us here in the homeland as one that transcends borders. Much of the activity in this space takes the place online. REMV adherents are linked primarily by shared violent extremist ideologies and influence, in contrast to traditional foreign terrorist organizations who are also linked both operationally and structurally. The transnational REMV movement is largely fluid, fragmented, and lacking in hierarchical structures. The movement frames actions around the concept of leaderless resistance. This is a fundamentally different threat construct than we have been traditionally fighting in the United States. Now I know the next session is gonna delve deeply into the tragic attack that killed 10 in Buffalo in May. Well, let me just use that as an example. The alleged Buffalo shooter, against whom charges are still pending, is the most recent example of how the REMV threat is both decentralized and transnational. That attacker drew inspiration from the manifestos of social media pages and posts that international REMV attackers from Norway in 2011 and New Zealand in 2019 had leveraged. This threat is not bounded by borders. It is driven by individuals and networks that share ideas and messages to incite violence. Indeed, an increasing number of transnational online REMV networks have emerged in the past decade. They play a role in shaping ideology and connectivity that this, for this movement in four key ways. First, they create and disseminate propaganda that promotes violent extremist narratives and tactics. Second, they help radicalize individuals through online violent extremist messaging and public activity. Third, they occasionally provide opportunities for real world networking so the movement can grow. And finally, they inspire some adherents to engage in violence against minorities, government officials, and other perceived enemies. 
These transnational networks are often transitory in nature. They have fluid membership, they focus on inspiring others to engage in violence rather than organizing the violence themselves. The loose organizational structure of these RUMV networks creates a resilience against disruption efforts, and importantly, it can hinder efforts to identify which members are most likely to mobilize to violence. U.S.-based REMV's linkage to foreign counterparts mostly involves the bidirectional sharing of violent extremist messaging, mutual grievances, manifestos of successful attackers, and encouragement for lone actor violence. And as with other terrorism challenges, REMV's operate transnationally by leveraging today's world connected by social media and other platforms. And even as technology companies improve their capabilities to detect and respond to violent content online, REMV adversaries find new methods to spread their message. In May, the tech platform where the live stream of the Buffalo attack was posted removed that live stream within two minutes after the violence began. That was the fastest live stream removal we have seen to date. And yet, the message spread. Images spread. Original and altered video clips are still widely shared by users on other platforms, those that are less able or less inclined to take action. Now, I highlight the transnational nature of the REMV threat as a way to help characterize the complexity of the challenge that we're all facing. But I don't want to leave the impression that this threat is more predominant overseas. To be clear, the intelligence community assesses REMVs driven by a belief in the superiority of the white race present the most likely terrorism threat of lethal violence against civilians in the United States. 21 years after 9-11, and that is a remarkable statement. Since the beginning of 2010, REMVs espousing white supremacies have accounted for 17 attacks, killing a total of 77 people here. These REMV's, REMV attacks include some of the gravest acts of mass violence in recent experience. In addition to this year's Buffalo shooting tar targeting black Americans, the 2019 attack at an El Paso Walmart targeted immigrant populations. Here in Pittsburgh in 2018, those of Jewish faith were attacked. And in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015, black churchgoers were the target. Adding to the complexity of understanding the REMV threat in the homeland is a trend that we're seeing increasing over the past several years. It's the convergence of motivational drivers and ideologies across extre violent extremist actors. The narratives and grievances used by REMVs are highly dynamic and adaptive across the globe. Their narratives are influencing different types of violent extremists who are coalescing around an overlapping sense of perceived grievances. They're also congregating in the same social media spaces where we're seeing an increase in ideological mixing. Some violent extremists blend together narratives and messages from traditional foreign terrorist organizations or militia violent extremist themes and blend those with REMV messages. This blurring of what used to be more distinct motivational or ideological buckets means that it is ever more important for law enforcement agencies and the intelligence community to analyze and warn about emerging threats from across the ideological spectrum. Another important trend in the REMV space is the radicalization of juveniles, something my foreign counterparts raise with me with increasing frequency. Violent extremist narratives can offer juveniles structure that they may have trouble finding or accepting elsewhere. And these narratives are very good at promising troubled youth an apparent chance to overcome perceived victimization. REMVs in particular understand this, and they can be very opportunistic at targeting at-risk youth. They promote violent messages on platforms popular with teenagers and frequently combine traditional REMV narratives with discussions of video games and youth culture to attract young adherents. So giving the evolving terrorism challenge that we're facing exemplified by this growing REMV threat, NCTC itself is evolving to meet the challenge. This became most pronounced here after the Tree of Life synagogue attack in Pittsburgh four years ago. After that attack, at the request of DHS and the FBI, 
NCTC began to take a closer look at how it could lend its expertise derived from 15 years in the international terrorism arena to support agencies and organizations working to counter domestic terrorism. Today, NCTC's first priority is to identify any connections between domestic terrorism and international terrorism, focusing on the transnational dynamics of the threat to and within the United States homeland. Our analysis on international terrorism and tactics, techniques, and pr procedures has been directly applicable to the threat in the United States from REMDs and other violent extremists. Our ability to fuse this information into easily accessible toolkits and produce unclassified assessments that we can pass to federal, state, local, and other partners across a variety of platforms is a key part of how we do our mission. Our work aims to better equip our partners to carry out their terrorism prevention and disruption missions and enables policymakers to better understand the problem and take meaningful steps to address hard issues. Let me give you a couple of concrete examples before I conclude. Over the last year, NCTC has supported DHS and FBI by providing US-based technology companies with strategic information regarding terrorists' online modus operandi, key terrorism trends that are online, and terrorism-related hashtags, keywords, and logos. Since 2020, NCTC has contributed to dozens of engagements with US tech companies, from larger social media companies to smaller niche platforms. These updates on terrorist content, tactics, and imagery inform tech companies' independent efforts to ensure their platforms are not vehicles for terrorist plotting and mobilization to violence. There's another resource that I think this group will be particularly interested in. The 2021 edition of the U.S. Violent Extremist Mobilization Indicators Booklet, which we publish alongside FBI and DHS. This, bu this booklet provides first responders in particular, including state and local law enforcement and terrorism prevention practitioners, with a tool that identifies observable behavior that could help determine whether individuals are preparing to engage in violent extremist activities. Now, we last published an update to this booklet in December, and this latest update departs from earlier iterations that focus exclusively on foreign-inspired actors. Now, the indicators are framed inclusive of both foreign and domestic ideological motivations. The booklet is repeatedly held up as a valuable resource by state and local law enforcement. It is by far the most cited product when I engage with my state and local counterparts. They incorporate it into their business practices, they help treat, and it helps them triage their intake processes and helps investigators understand what they are seeing. Another way we share information is through a collaborative effort, again, among DHS and FBI, called the Joint Counterterrorism Assessment Team, or JCAT for short. JCAT focuses on building strong and sustainable relationships with stakeholders across the country that are often leveraged to support the CT mission. Key partners include fire departments, police and law enforcement entities, health and emergency medical professionals, and state and local fusion centers. I hope what you're getting out of this is that we believe at NCTC that outreach and connectivity with those most likely to experience and respond to a terrorist incident is a key part of our mission. We are part of the intelligence community. We serve policymakers in DC. We serve decision makers across the spectrum. But we include um, decision makers at the lowest level of our governments, the ones most likely to be at the point of impact as an important and critical part of protecting the country and doing our mission. So let me just conclude by reinforcing my belief that NCTC has important value to add as a part of the diverse and multidisciplinary community that you have brought here together, Laura, to address violent extremism and hate-based violence. I also want to be humble in that I think we have a lot to learn from this same community. I view our presence at events like this as foundational to our understanding of the threat environment that we were founded to protect Americans against, however it might evolve. So working together, 
we have the greatest chance for success in addressing the sustained threat that terrorists and violent extremists pose to the American public, our democratic institutions, and our government and law enforcement officials. Addressing this threat demands concerted action, coordinated implementation, and careful respect for civil rights and civil liberties. In short, it demands the best of our country. And for that, Laura, I am grateful to you for bringing the best together today. Thank you for making me a part of it and allowing me to engage with this amazing community. I look forward to the results of this year's summit and supporting you in future years as well. Thank you very much.